Chapter 61 What a Corporal Was Worth In the customs shed at Monsanto Airport, we were all required to submit to a luggage inspection and to convert what money we intended to spend in San Lorenzo into the local currency, into corporals, which Papa Monsanto insisted were worth 50 American cents. The shed was neat and new, but plenty of signs had already been slapped on the walls. Higgly piggly. Anybody caught practicing Bokanonism in San Lorenzo, said one, will die on the hook. Another poster featured a picture of Bokanon, a scrawny old colored man who was smoking a cigar. He looked clever, in kind, and amused. Under the picture were the words, Wanted, dead, or alive. 10,000 corporals reward. I took a closer look at that poster and found reproduced at the bottom of it some sort of police identification form Bokanon had to fill out way back when in 1929. It was reproduced, apparently, to show Bokanon hunters what his fingerprints and handwriting were like. But what interested me were some of the words Bokanon had chosen to put into the blanks in 1929. Wherever possible, he had taken the cosmic view, had taken into consideration, for instance, such things as the shortness of life and the longness of eternity. He reported his avocation as being alive. He reported his principal occupation as being dead. This is a Christian nation. All foot play will be punished by the hook, said another sign. The sign was meaningless to me, since I had not yet learned that Bokanonists mingled their souls by pressing the bottoms of their feet together. And the greatest mystery of all, since I had not read all of Philip Castle's book, was how Bokanon, bosom friend of Corporal McCabe, had come to be an outlaw. Chapter 62 Why Hazel Wasn't Scared There were seven of us who got off at San Lorenzo. Newt and Angela, Ambassador Minton and his wife, H. Lo Crosby and his wife, and I. When we had cleared customs, we were herded outdoors and onto a reviewing stand. There we faced a very quiet crowd. Five thousand or more San Lorenzans stared at us. The islanders were oatmeal colored. The people were thin. There wasn't a fat person to be seen. Every person had teeth missing. Many legs were bowed or swollen. Not one pair of eyes was clear. The women's breasts were bare and paltry. The men wore loose loincloths that did little to conceal. Peens like pendulum pendulums on grandfather clocks. There were many dogs, but not one barked. There were many infants, but not one cried. Here and there someone coughed, and that was all. A military band stood at attention before the crowd. It did not play. There was a color guard before the band. It carried two banners, the stars and stripes, and the flag of San Lorenzo. The flag of San Lorenzo consisted of a Marine Corporal chevrons on a royal blue field. The banners hung lank in the windless day. I imagined that somewhere far away I heard the blamming of a sledge on a brazen drum. There was no such sound. My soul was simply resonating the beat of the, of the brassy, clanging heat of the San Lorenzo climb. I'm sure glad it's a Christian country, Hazel Crosby whispered to her husband, or I'd be a little scared. Behind us was an xylophone. There was a glittering sign on the xylophone. The sign was made of garnets and rhinestones. The sign said Mona. Chapter 63, Reverent and Free. <sighs> to the left side of our reviewing stand were six propeller-driven fighter planes in a row, military assistance from the United States to San Lorenzo. 
on the fuselage of each plane was painted with childish bloodlust, a boa constrictor which was crushing a devil to death. <clears throat> Blood came from the devil's ears, nose, and mouth. A pitchfork was slipping from satanic red fingers. Before each plane stood an oatmeal-colored pilot, silent, too. <laughs> then above that tumid silence there came a nagging song like the song of a gnat. It was a siren approaching. The siren was on Papa's glossy black Cadillac limousine. The limousine came to a stop before us, tire smoking. <sighs> Out climbed Papa Manzano, his adopted daughter Mona Amons Manzano, and Franklin Honecker. At a limp, imperious signal from Papa, the crowd sang the San Lorenzo National Anthem. Its melody was Home on the Range. The words have been written in 1922 by Lionel Boyd Johnson by Bokanon. The words were these. <sighs> Oh, ours is a land where the living is grand, and the men are as fearless as sharks. The women are pure, and we always are sure that our children will all tow their marks. San, San Lorenzo, what a rich, lucky island are we. Our enemies quail, for they know they will fail against people so reverent and free. Chapter 64, Peace and Plenty. And then the crowd was deathly still again. Papa said, and Mona and Frank joined us on the reviewing stand. One snare drum played as they did so. The drumming stopped when Papa pointed a finger at the drummer. He wore a shoulder holster on the outside of his blouse. The weapons in it was a chromium-plated 45. He was an old, old man, so as so many members of my caress were. He was in poor shape. His steps were small and bounceless. He was still a fat man, but his lard was melting fast, for his simple uniform was loose. The balls of his hop-toed eyes were yellow, and his hands trembled. His personal bodyguard was Major General Franklin Honecker, whose uniform was white. Frank, thin-wristed, narrow shoulder, looked like a child kept up long after his customary bedtime. On his breast was a medal. I observed the two, Papa and Frank, with some difficulty. Not because my view was blocked, but because I could not take my eyes off Mona. I was thrilled, heartbroken, Hilarious, insane. Every greedy, unreasonable dream I'd ever had about a woman, about what a woman should be, came true in Mona. <sighs> there, God love her warm and creamy soul, was peace and plenty forever. That girl, and she was only 18, was rapturously serene. She seemed to understand all, and to be there was to understand. In the books of Bokanon, she is mentioned by name. One thing Bokanon says of her is this, Mona has the simplicity of the all. Her dress was white and Greek. She wore flat sandals on her small brown feet. Her pale gold hair was lank and long. Her hips were a liar. Oh God, peace and plenty forever. She was the one beautiful girl in San Lorenzo. She was the national treasure. Papa had adopted her, according to Philip Castle, in order to mingle divinity with the harshness of his rule. The xylophone was rolled to the front of the stand, and Mona played it. She played, when day is done, it was all tremolo, swelling, fading, swelling again. The crowd was intoxicated by beauty. And then it was time for Papa to greet us. 
Chapter 65. A good time to come to San Lorenzo. Papa was a self-educated man who had been major domo to Corporal McCabe. He had never been off the island. He spoke American English passably well. Everything that any one of us said on the reviewing stand was bellowed out at the crowd through doomsday horns. Whatever went out through those horns gabbled down a wide, short boulevard at the back of the crowd, ricocheting off the three glass-faced new buildings at the end of the boulevard. It came cackling back. Welcome, said Papa. You're coming to... You are coming to the best friend America ever had. America is misunderstood many places. We're not here, Mr. Ambassador. He bowed to H. Lo Crosby, the, bicy the bicycle manufacturer, mistaking him for the new ambassador. I know you got a good country here, Mr. President, said Crosby. Everything I ever heard about it sounds great to me. There's just one thing. Oh? I'm not the ambassador, said Crosby. I wish I was, but I'm just a plain, ordinary businessman. It hurt him to say who the real ambassador was. This man over here is the big cheese. Ah. Papa smiled at his mistake. The smile went away suddenly. Some pain inside of him made him wince, then made him hunch over. Close his eyes, made him concentrate on surviving the pain. Frank Honecker went to his support, feebly, incompetently. Are you all right? Excuse me. <laughs> Papa whispered at last, strength straightening up some. There were tears in his eyes. He brushed them away, straightening up all the way. I beg your pardon? He seemed to be in doubt for a moment as to where he was, as to what was expected of him. But then he remembered. He shook Horlick Mitten's hand. Here, you are among friends. I'm sure of it, said Mitten gently. Christian, said Papa. Good. Anti-communists, said Papa. Good. No communists here, said Papa. They fear the hook too much. Now I should think they would, said Minton. You have picked a very good time to come to us, said Papa. Tomorrow will be one of the happiest days in the history of our country. Tomorrow is our greatest national holiday, the day of the hundred martyrs to democracy. It will also be the day of the engagement of Major General Honecker to Mona Emons Monsano, to the most precious person in my life and in the life of San Lorenzo. I wish you much happiness, Miss Monsano, said Mitten warmly, and I congratulate you, General Honecker. The two people nodded their thanks. Mitten now spoke of the so-called hundred martyrs to democracy, and he told a whooping lie. There is not an American schoolchild who does not know the story of San Lorenzo's noble sacrifice in World War II. The, brave hun the hundred brave San Lorenzans, whose day tomorrow is, gave as much as freedom-loving men can. The President of the United States has asked me to be his personal representative at ceremonies tomorrow, to cast a wreath, the gift of the American people to the people of San Lorenzo on the sea. The people of San Lorenzo, thank you and your President and the generous people of the United States of America for their thoughtfulness, said Papa. We should be honored if you would cast a wreath into the sea during the engagement party tomorrow. The honor is mine. Papa commanded us all to honor him with our presence at the wreath ceremony and engagement party next day. We were to appear at his palace at noon. 
What children these two will have, Papa said, inviting us to stare at Frank and Mona. What blood, what beauty. The pain hit him again. He again closed his eyes to huddle himself around that pain. He wanted for it to pass, but it did not pass. Still in agony, he turned away from us, faced the crowd and the microphone. He tried to gesture at the crowd, failed. He tried to say something to the crowd, failed. And then the words came out. Go home, he cried, strangling. Go home. The crowd scattered like leaves. Papa faced us again, still grotesque in pain. And then he collapsed.